You are freer than you think. It's like the ultimate form of freedom. You expound upon that freedom to develop on this planet. True freedom comes from within. It's the ability. Thinking to myself, I can help you or I can destroy you. Man is a two-time felon. I work really hard and I've been, a, I've been a life learner. When things are feeling tough, let yourself be surprised. The world favors risk-taking. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Freedom Pact. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the show. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Paul Bloom. Paul Bloom is Professor of Psychology at the University of Toronto and Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Yale University. In the psychological space, Paul is a big name. He is widely known for his research and writing. Paul's research is focused on moral and cognitive psychology, with focuses on how people make sense of the world that we live in. Today, Paul and I will be discussing his latest book, The Sweet Spot, The Pleasures of Suffering and the Search for Meaning, which will explore the idea of why suffering may be crucial in living a meaningful and happy life. Before we start today's episode, on a personal note, I just want to say that after a three-month break from the podcast in space, it feels so good to be back. I'm really excited about the content that we have in store to bring you guys this year. So, with that said, I hope that you enjoy this episode with Paul Bloom. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me here. Such a pleasure. So, I read your book and I absolutely loved it. Um, I figured a great place to start, one of the ways that we like to typically kick off an episode, particularly like this, where we'll okay. be talking about, I would say, three psychological phenomena in particular, and I guess they would be suffering, pleasure, meaning, if we look at those. Um, so I've just figured a good place to start would be if we could just get some work in definitions yeah. for those three terms before we kind of delve into the episode so everyone is on a kind of a, a, a same foot in so how would you define suffering pleasure and meaning and then we can jump in from there well, that's that's an easy question to begin <laughs> with um you know all of these terms are complicated none have a simple straightforward definition to give you but i'll tell you how i'm using the terms because you know i'm going to be making these arguments in my book i argue that suffering is chosen suffering can be good it could be a source of pleasure it could be a source of meaning so you're right to ask me, what do i mean suffering as i'm using the word refers to anything negative so it could be like honest to god terrible things like great pain great anguish and everything it could also be discomfort boredom struggle a mild pain suffering just anything negative anything normally you'd want to say i don't want it pleasure is kind of the opposite pleasure is is everything positive um everything that on balance you say yeah i like it i like it and um every you know it could be you know the the heights of of sexual pleasure and personal pleasure it can also be something as as pleasant as just eating something you enjoy or or standing outside and it feels nice so both of those terms they have their extremes but i'm using them for the full range suffering negative uh pleasure positive you get to meaning and meaning meaning is a tough one but um, the sense I'm using as, as meaning, I'm talking about, about meaningful pursuits. And so intuitively, we have a sense of what pursuits are meaningful and what aren't. You know, if I told you I'm going to, uh, I raised a couple of kids, you say, oh, that's kinda, I can see meaning. And I, I climbed Mount Everest. Wow, that's something. Um, I'm going to cure world hunger. That's really good. If I told you I sat on the, on the sofa last night and watched Netflix and got drunk, you'd say, that's, that's maybe you know, whatever, but that's not meaningful. And so some pursuits people view as meaningful. What makes something meaningful is sort of a matter of some investigation, but I think for something to be meaningful, it has to be difficult, it has to involve struggle, it has to involve the possibility of failure. It is extended over time. It's, um, it's kind of non-trivial. It, it, it has some substance to it and some struggle to it. So roughly that's how I would start off. And presumably in terms of meaning, you're talking about something that has uh, kind of 30,000 feet goals, then it has sub goals within it. So yeah. it's something that has a series of, of ongoing pursuits within that one topic. That's right. That's right. So 
you think of anything, anything that deserves to be called a meaningful pursuit won't just be the sort of thing you could do in 10 seconds. It's not just, thing, you know, so, you know, climbing Mount Everest, raising kids, um, you know, starting a business and like that just requires a million sub goals. Yeah, it does have that structure. Amazing. I, 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 hopefully we can delve into each one of those those uh, terms with, with examples from the book. Uh, but obviously you mentioned suffering. Uh, I, you mentioned that you, di- you kind of break suffering down into two different types within the book. Uh, so perhaps we could talk about, uh, you know, benign suffering and how you, dis- you, how you differentiate that from, from other kinds. So I, there's all sorts of distinctions in the book. Um, I'll just tell you right now what the, what the claim I make is. I'm exploring the idea. I'm, well, put it a different way. I, I wrote it because I'm fascinated by why we choose suffering, why some people choose um, to go to movies that frighten them, to do, go to hot baths, eat spicy foods, engage in uh, sadomasochistic sex, run marathons, do all sorts of suffering that they choose to do, um, but, uh, but doesn't serve any obvious goal, you know? It's not you don't you don't engage in sadomasochistic sex or go to a scary movie because you want something out of it in the end. The activity is its own reward. And why in the world do we do that? And and that's so suffering. And and then and then I got into the question of how is suffering part of a meaningful life? But for all of this to get to your distinction, I'm talking about chosen suffering, the, the mm-hmm. suffering we opt for. And I would say that's very different from unchosen suffering, which is the bad stuff that happens to us that we didn't we didn't ask for. The death of a child, getting cancer, your house burns down, you get assaulted. And I am not arguing that that's good for you. In fact, I know some people who do, they talk about post-traumatic growth and, and transcendence. And all. No, I'm skeptical. I think sometimes bad stuff, typical unchosen suffering is something you'd want to avoid. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have positive outcomes. Well, well, that's a very interesting point. And I actually did an episode with uh, Bessel van der Kolk uh, do you know him from The Body Keeps the Score? He's a psychiatrist. I've heard of the book, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he, he was a great guy. And I asked him the question about post-traumatic growth because this is, you know, one of the the, the main figures, I guess, in the voice of, of trauma and PTSD. And I expected him to say, yeah, yeah, you know, I've seen her a million times. And he said, let's not fetishize, you know, post-traumatic because he said it's yeah. far better to avoid this thing. So I, I take it you hold the same opinion that it's probably yeah. better to avoid <laughs> being traumatized. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's right. I would, I would, you know, I wouldn't doubt it's a big world. A lot of things can happen or something bad could happen, which actually has a good outcome. You get assaulted and somehow it changes your life, makes you a better person, makes you more spirit. Yeah, it could happen. People are complicated, but on the whole, bad things don't do you good. Bad things sometimes do you bad. We're more resilient than people think we are. The, the, the data on resilience says that post-traumatic, you know, stress disorder, trauma are, are rarer than we think. But you know, bad things tend to be bad. Here, right. common sense wins. Yeah, I, and I, I think that there's also um, uh, kind of within this that we're also great storytellers. Yeah. If I go through a terrible breakup and I waste twenty years of my life, I say, you know, I was. I was meant to go through that because it's given me this and this and this, but you don't have a control group. You don't have a twin that didn't go through that. So perhaps that kind of feeds into that as well. Yeah. That's what, what uh, Dan Gilbert, like a Harvard psychologist calls the psychological immune system. Mm-hmm. We're, we're really good at telling stories and everything, but it turns out when you do the studies with control groups, so you're right. Any individual, we just experience it. We tell our stories and you can never know, but you get a hundred people for whom something terrible happened and 100 people who were unscathed, the first group isn't better than the second group. In fact, the first group often turns out worse. <laughs> better, better, not to, better not to break up from your 20-year relationship. <laughs> Here I am yeah. with, with, with advice. Avoid, suffer, avoid unchosen suffering if you can. Right. It's, and it's also the first rule of medicine, the Hippocratic oath, do no harm, including yes. to yourself if you can. So yeah. yes. I, I yes. enjoy that. Oh, please, please. But my, but my book says... The right sort of harm, if you choose it, the right sort of struggle, difficulty, pain, damage, could be really a lot of fun, as well as could give your life meaning. Yeah, and, and I think that this is a great distinction that we've made, there because, you know, for clarification, in a book about suffering, we're not talking about, as you said, the unchosen suffering. We're not talking about, uh, you know, getting cancer, for instance. What we're yeah. talking about here is, uh, I believe David Sinclair, he... he um, uh, the Harvard biologist, he used the term 
hormesis, which is this term for what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. For instance, something like intermittent fasting or, uh, you know, some heavy exercise, this type of suffering. Um, Yeah. So I'd love to just ask you a question. Just this is quite a selfish question, just out of my my own curiosity. Uh, Are there any personality traits that you're aware of that predict whether someone will be more attracted to suffering? You know, so there's a, there's a, an answer to your question, which is maybe very unsatisfying, which is sensation seeking, cor- the, the trait of sensation seeking correlates with choosing suffering. The reason why that's such a terrible answer is that when you look at what makes up sensation seeking, it's a bunch of questions roughly, you know, do you like skydiving? Do you like rock climbing? Do you like, um, do you like scary movies? So I'm telling you, basically, people who say they like scary movies tend to like scary movies. It doesn't tell you anything. But so you may want to wonder, you may wonder, like, um, I'll even put this to sort of of two questions. One question is, who likes uh, unchosen, sorry, who likes chosen suffering? And what kind, like, who, what's the kind of person likes horror movies? What kind of person likes BDSM? What's the kind of person who likes hot baths? What kind of person who likes to run marathons? Honestly, we don't know. There's, there's, you know, people have looked at this and there's no patterns that come out. To put it differently, I could know, I could give you a million personality tests and I couldn't predict from this whether you like spicy foods, whether you like BDSM, whether you like running marathons. Just, it seems to be, there must be some factors explaining why this person likes this, this person like that. We don't know what they are. Even gender. So look, for instance, um, it's often said that men like scary movies, like horror movies more than women. And it's true, but the effect is really small. When you ask people, it's just a little effect. It's it's very hard to predict this. Yeah, I, I wonder perhaps if it's something biological, perhaps some some mm-hmm. dopamine mm-hmm. sort of thing. Perhaps it'd be a question for Andrew Huberman to, <laughs> to ask. But yeah, um, I, I'm interested as well because when I was thinking about suffering, um, I was thinking about the role of suffering in making us happy. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's clearly a, an oxymoron because most people, they think that happiness would be, I guess, the antithesis of, of suffering. So yeah. I guess, could, could you explain that, how the role yeah. of suffering? And I think that that's wrong. I think, um, you know, you, you could think of it in terms of all the psychological data and the research and how people choose suffering in the right place. But, but think of it more, I don't know, there's a Twilight Zone episode I talk about in my book. Just, just to get, get the thought here. In, in this episode, there's mobster, right? He dies. And then uh, he, to his surprise, he ends up in what seems to be heaven. He's in this beautiful hotel suite. Uh, and he finds, he has a guide who says, you know, you can do whatever you want here. So he plays poker and he wins. Says, this is great. This is great. And then, you know, women flock to him. He defeats his enemies easily and everything like this. And he starts going, getting bored frustrating and finally he says to this guy you know maybe i don't belong in heaven maybe i belong in the other place and the guy says this is the other place there's there's a certain sort of hell in a life that gave you constant reward no friction no risk no worry it would soon become cloying and grating and boring and ultimately in a sense agonizing pleasure requires pain um satisfaction requires the risk of failure happiness requires sadness and so a good life includes the proper allocation of the negative so you could experience the positive. I remember when I uh, first started the show with my, my co-host, Lewis, and um, for any long-term listeners of the show, they would have heard me at the beginning talking about things like uh, maximizing the amount of free time that one has, uh, remote location agreements, trying to work from home when you can, considering entrepreneurship or investments i guess as a means to gain control and agency over one's life and i still do think that uh it is important to have a sense of agency and control but looking back i do think that um that was largely based on a hedonistic yeah uh position and you know for instance if someone reads the the four hour work week by by tim ferris I, I I would say perhaps you might disagree or someone might disagree, but I think that book is is a hedonistic book. And you read that and you think, well, all I need is to lie on a beach in Thailand 
sipping margaritas for the rest of us, and that would be a good life. I've changed my position much similarly to yours now, and I completely agree that, you know, I do think that it's meaningful pursuits with people that you care about. Um, but I do wonder, because you kind of talked about the suffering, and, and I think that a lot of people, that they, they kind of view happiness as perhaps a life free from responsibility. Yeah which kind of is hedonism. If you were to issue, I guess, a counter argument to hedonism, what, what would that be? Um, it, it would go along certain lines. I'll make two sort of counter arguments to hedonism because there are people who try their best to just live a life of great happiness. I know a few. And, uh, and there's two arguments. One is that it's ultimately upon reflection unsatisfying. You, you want to... Um, People want, for instance, I, I, I defend in the book what's called motivational pluralism, which is that we want a lot of things. It's a great term as well. A great yeah, term. I mean, it's not my, but, but, it, but it captures, hey, we want a lot of things. We, we want to be get pleasure, but we also want to be good. You know, if, 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 if somebody gets a lot of pleasure because they're a sadist and they torture people and enjoy it, you look at this, it's not the ideal life that misses out something else. We want to have meaningful pursuits. We want to have psychological adversity. Uh, we want to sort of explore, have, have, have a breadth of experience. We have a lot, a lot of things we want. And I would suggest that a hedonist ultimately, assuming that they don't view pleasure, there's a sense of pleasure which includes everything and then everyone's a hedonist. But in the sense of narrow pleasures, they would, I would say, you're not scratching all your riches. You're not, you're, not, you're not maximizing your life. You're living a life that's not as satisfying as another kind of life. So that's one argument, which is sort of saying, look, if you look within yourself, you'll see this isn't the best way to do it. The second uh, point is that hedonism is an interesting sense, um, a self-refuting endeavor, where there's a lot of empirical research suggesting that people who try to be happy, people who try to get pleasure are kind of miserable. And, um, and I think one reason is they get bored. You know, simple pleasures tend to be boring after a while. Um, and another reason is they tend to be, um, they, they tend to miss the fact that what really gives us satisfaction is often, you know, extensive, uh, uh, protracted relationships, uh, love and work, you know, romantic romance over a long period of time, long-term projects, I don't know, doing a podcast, something like that, something like, which doesn't immediately give you a buzz. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but if you, if you take the long view, these long-term projects, having kids, um, you know, learning a new language, training for a sport, that in the end gives you the most payoff over time. Yeah, this, this is really interesting. And clearly, as you said, Bade, that there is uh, definitely, in, in my view, similar to what you say, there is a, a clear evolutionary reason. You know, I mean, Sinclair, when, when he came on the show, he talked about that, that small adversity in part is without question good for your body, great for longevity. Clearly, that is wired into us that there is uh, suffering within the meaning equation. Uh, similarly, for, for pleasure, and there's a couple of great studies I'd love to get into about that. But in terms of, of evolution, mm -hmm. where does evolution fit into all this? Because clearly, there must be some sort of evolutionary adaption there. How do you do that? So you can ask the question at a couple of levels. So why would evolution wire us up to be pluralist? And the answer is that... Um, Animals seek out pleasure because pleasure often corresponds to what's, what's good for you. You know, we get pleasure from drinking when we're thirsty. And that, that's a really good thing. That, that's an evolved adaptation. We get pleasure from sex because creatures that didn't get from pleasure from sex had less sex and people, creatures that had less sex, reproduce less. And so they, they, they didn't make it to, to be us. Um, so, so pleasure often is, is in, <coughs> sorry, in response to an evolutionary need. But so are things like morality. You know, theories of evolution appeal to things like kin selection, reciprocal altruism, and talk about the adaptive benefits we have from caring for those who share our genes, caring for those we're in reciprocal interactions with. There's evolutionary arguments for long-term goals, for purpose, for, for effort. You know, us and a lot of other creatures too, give value to effort. And, um, and this is in some way, because that's a good trick things that you want, things that are worthwhile, things that help the organism survive and reproduce often require a lot of work. And so some appetite for that becomes adaptive. Um, and there you get into suffering, which is indifferent. I think some of our use of suffering for pleasure is a hack, is something we've thought of, doesn't have an evolutionary history. Um, 
hot baths and saunas are probably just like, you know, clever ideas we thought to maximize our pleasure, but other aspects of suffering that connect to meaningful pursuits, I think is part and parcel of the value of doing difficult things. And so we're wired up to appreciate that. Yeah, that, that's really, really interesting point. And I'm thinking similar, I, I think you make this, this kind of thing in the book, um, where you talk about clearly that there's also made adaptions to be able to uh, make adaptions um, from suffering. Because I guess if someone is willing to suffer and go and learn a medical textbook or suffer through getting journals published and becoming a great academic or uh, growing big muscles in the gym, then clearly that is a, a signal to be a, a, a high value mate. So is there something in there as well? I mean, that's one perspective. I would take it a bit broader, but I think you're, okay. not, you're not wrong, which is often one explanation for chosen suffering. Just don't give as much emphasis as I should maybe. It's what, what people in the business call signaling. You want to signal something. Mm. So in religious rituals, for instance, people often undergo great pain or sacrifice and so on. And they're signaling their piety or their strength of will. Sometimes people undergo very painful things to show off. Look how strong I am. Sometimes, alternatively, people put themselves in situations where they suffer as a cry for help. So some of it is, is to be attractive, but some of it is, is serves other social goals. And yeah, so a lot of chosen suffering is out there, is public. And if I know of somebody who's capable of enduring great pain and difficulty and struggle, it's somebody I could be impressed by. That's, those are impressive capacities. And so some of it is, I think, advertising, signaling. And similar to, to your book, another great book, which I thought uh, come out was uh, Angela Duckworth's Grit. And I, I do get quite similar, I guess, comparisons between who's and would you say that kind of grit falls into the suffering equation, perhaps? I think grit or, you know, the older term conscientiousness. Conscientiousness, but, sure. But, but Duckworth adds a bit with, with, with grit. Um, could be viewed as the capacity to sustain effort um, and intensity and time when you don't feel like it. Um, and, and, uh, and so in, for certain sorts of chosen suffering, they are related to grit. I think the difference would be, one difference would be, um, Angela talks about grit in the context of achieving certain goals. So you struggle to get a certain goal. That's interesting. And that's something which we do definitely, you know, I, I don't know, I got to go to the store. I have to walk to the store. I don't want to walk to the store, but I got to walk to the store to get whatever I want. Um, but I'm more interested in suffering for its own sake, for, for the own rewards it has rather than as a means to an end. That's one way in which my focus differs from hers. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. And like, I, I, I feel like we've, we've covered quite a lot by you. And I just want to just pick up on just one uh, clarification that I just like. Uh, so obviously we've talked about the evolutionary reasons behind suffering. We've talked about how, uh, you know, there's clearly some sort of role in suffering and happiness or pleasure. But I'm just curious, can you just kind of clarify that relationship between, you know, why is suffering wired into a, into us to live, I guess, a meaningful life? Because this is something that I'm just really trying to get my head around of, of why yeah. that is the case. I just find this so interesting. Well, and, and I think it's, it's, it's worth pressing on this because there's, in the case of pleasure, often we just choose to suffer. We say, ah, I'm gonna you know, eat this really spicy food. I'm gonna go to this movie, it's gonna scare the pants off me. You know, we choose suffering. For other pursuits, it's not quite the same. Nobody says, I'm gonna have kids because I really like sleepless nights and arguments with my partner and struggle and difficulty and money worries and so on. Nobody says, I'm gonna train for a marathon. I really hope I get blisters and maybe a sprained ankle and maybe give up. You don't do that. You don't, for, for those longer term pursuits, you don't seek out suffering directly. But at the same time, and this goes back to your first question about meaning, the way to think about it is a pursuit that's worth doing, that's meaningful, has as part of its very definition, suffering and pain and difficulty and struggle. If it didn't have that, it wouldn't be meaningful. If, if, if you, you know, it's hard to imagine you telling me something that is, is very meaningful and important and significant, you take pride in, that has no difficulty to it. Yeah. That's just yeah. easy. And 
And so in, the, in these cases then, we, we, we pursue suffering kind of as a byproduct of pursuing purposeful, meaningful, important activities. It's not instrumental in the way it is for pleasure where we kind of zap some, some suffering to kind of increase our kick later on, you know, um, but, but in, in the case of these pers meaningful pursuits, it's part and parcel with them. So is it fair to say that if that is the case, that if, I guess, happiness perhaps is a byproduct of meaning and suffering, as you say, is it perhaps best to just give up on directly focusing on happiness? Well, again, you know, I'm, it's the pluralist in me. Pluralist, yeah. So I'm not a hedonist, but I'm not an anti-hedonist. If you, you know, after a hot day, a cool glass of water feels very good. You might as well drink it. You, you, you know, you're, you're, you're allowed to, you know, you're allowed to eat food that, 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 that tastes good here. You know, that is, the pleasure is a really important part of life. I just would suggest, and this is the pluralist again, um, that is not the only part of life and there are these other pursuits. So I'm not really telling people, you don't want to tell people give up on pleasure. Pleasure is important. Um, and sometimes suffering could make pleasure even more pleasurable. Mm. You know, again, BDSM, scary movies and so on. But when it comes to these longer term pursuits, those are ones where you want to sort of put aside pleasure and seek out other things. Yeah, I, de I definitely love to jump into the, the BDSM theories with, with you in a bit. But I, there's a study in the book that you talked about. And please forgive me if I'm butchering his name, but is it George Lo Lovenstein? Lowenstein, yeah. Lowenstein. Yeah. Uh, and this was about uh, delayed gratification, heightening pleasure. Yeah. Now, this was really interesting because uh, I remember an economics module I did, and it was kind of the opposite of this because uh, the economic principle of the time value principle of money says that a dollar today is better than a dollar in six months' time because you could invest it or you could double yeah. it. But that study clearly says the opposite. It says that delaying gratification makes the gratification more pleasurable so could you talk about that and yeah, and, uh, yeah that's a very clever study I, I i kind of enjoy it so he um he, had, he used all sorts of examples but the one i remember was he says imagine you could kiss your favorite movie star on the lips consensually freely you could do this and is it that's nice and then um he asked you when do you want to do it and you're right economics 101 says now well right, let me get a breath minute and then i'm done now and then, because the more you wait, well, you could die, the movie star could die, things could change and everything. In general, we wanna do things right away. There's always this push to do things right away. It's, we discount the future, it's another way of putting it. But Lowenstein didn't find that. Lowenstein found, I forget the exact amount of time, it says something like, I wanna do it in two days. <laughs> two days is so weird. Um, and the answer, the reason for this is people wanted to savor the anticipation savor the feeling of not getting what you want, which is a strange thing. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. And uh, so, so that's, um, that's one example of, of, of how we're special, how, how we kind of play with time. The flip side, by the way, is if I tell you there's a very painful dental surgery you asked to have, again, economics 101 says, I want to put it off for as far in the future as I can. And sometimes we do that. But sometimes we also try to greedily um, do, in some way, we say, let's get it over with. And there, it's the opposite of savoring the anticipation. You want to avoid the dread. So much of our lives we think about, we, so much of our, our pleasures are consumed in our heads, thinking about the future, dreading it, and so on. Yeah, I, I, I really find this interesting. And, and I can definitely relate uh, and I, an example i would give I, i've talked about this on the show is my my colleague and and myself we did the the mount everest base camp walk and uh, when when we got to base camp after 13 grueling days you know you get to base camp and, and you can barely see because the the mountains are so bright mm -hmm. and uh, it was just kind of like you know what is it but it was it was the thought it was the training leading up to it yeah. It was it was the character building along the way. It was the relationships, but you actually get there, and it's kind of like the the reward was was second to the yes 
to the person, I guess, and the, the journey to become it. That's right. That's right. It's, it's funny because um, Lowenstein in another paper talks about mountain climbers, endurance mountain climbers, and you know, doing climbing to the, to the base camp of Everest is really impressive. And he says, you know, a lot of people think that what happens is really miserable, and then they get to the top and it's glorious. <laughs> and this is, yeah, actually, people get to the top, that fine, okay, then they go down. And, and it's not just a moment of glory and ecstasy. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the power, the appeal of these sort of activities is in the doing, is in the mastery of it, is in the working towards it, is in the struggle. And, uh, and, and you know, your, your basic scam story is a nice example of that. Yeah, and, and in fact, when we were coming back down, it, we wasn't saying, oh, what a great journey this has been. We were saying, when are we going to go to Kilimanjaro? That <laughs> you know it, it was, yeah. uh, but I'm curious. Do, do you think that we can take this too far? Do you think we can take, I guess, benign masochism? Can we take it to a, uh, sure. yeah, sure. I mean, um, in all sorts of ways, people people can choose to suffer in ways that uh, damage other parts of their lives, that damage their relationships. You know. Um, one example is that uh, people have in complicated relationships with food. And, um, and sometimes there's sort of a satisfaction in controlling your diet and being able to control what you eat and being able to master your hunger. It's a sort of uh, suffering that, 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 that makes people feel good about themselves. They're in control. But obviously, people could take it too far and become anorexic. And uh, there are a lot of, of diseases that could sing, think, be seen as diseases of control. Um, as another example, uh, um, you know, rigorous exercise, for instance, is a way of distracting yourself, getting yourself out of your head and so on. And so is cutting yourself in various forms of self-injury, sometimes which are just dangerous and, and, and reflect real problems. Um, as a third example, I think people sometimes take suffering too seriously. They take, they, they, there's an idea, and there's a lot of psychological research on this, that something, goodness requires suffering. And so we tend to discount people who do good things if they're not suffering through it and discount our own good deeds if we're not suffering as we do it. So yeah, I did, it definitely can be taken too far. Yeah, there's, there's, I got a lot, lot of points to, to, to discuss with you from there, but one example I'm thinking about is David Goggins. Now, I, I, are, you, are you aware of David Goggins? I'm not. Oh, he's, he's this uh, crazy, crazy ultra marathon runner, but in essence, he's this, He's a, a very inspirational man. He wrote a, a, great, a very good book called uh, Can't Hurt Me. But I, I would say he's, he's the extreme level of, of a benign masochist. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure of, of how much of, you know, a happy life that he lives, should we say. Um, but in, in any case, um, in terms of what, what you just said there, then perhaps there is some sort of optimal level of, of, of suffering. You know, and for instance, um, uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, he yeah. talks, you know, about flow. Um, I think, is it perhaps, uh, I can't remember the exact figures, perhaps you can help me, but it's some sort of percentile outside of your your, your level of competence, which, um, you know, leads to, to growth and flow. It, it, is, is that kind of related? Yeah, it's very related. I have a good chunk of my book on on flow because it's a wonderful example. Uh, Chik Senmei, who sadly, I think, passed away about a mm -hmm. month ago, um, coined this notion of flow and flow is you're right flow is is um is a state that's of the right intermediate level kind of a sweet spot that's neither too easy which it leads to boredom or nor too difficult which leads to anxiety and and stress and um and it, it, you know you know you're in a state of flow if you lose track of time that's sort of the diagnostic you lose track of time you forget to pick up the kids at school, you forget to eat, you just kind of just get, get stuck there because you lose your sense of self, you just get immersed. And it's not pleasure in any simple sense, it's hard. It's difficult to get in a state of flow. It's much easier to watch TV, you know, or just scroll the internet than pushing yourself to this state of, of, of the, this sort of somewhat difficult state. But when you get it, it's very satisfying. And um, in, 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 in his wonderful book on flow, which I read a while ago, it really affected me. He talks about all of these people who have lives of flow, um, musicians who practice for hours and hours and hours, 
rock climbers, you know, who, who just work on either bouldering or whatever, and they're just focused and really into it. A lot of athletes do it. Sometimes academics, scholars could be in states of flow. And it isn't pleasure in any simple sense, but it's hugely valuable for us. And similar, I guess, uh, to BDSM or climbing, I guess, Mount Everest or delivering a, le- a, a great lecture yeah. or writing a great paper. I think the one common thing that these activities have is that they kind of take you outside of yourself. Yeah, It's kind of a transcendent experience. Is that kind of right? Yeah, this is... um. You know, when I talk about BDSM, I draw upon the work of uh, Roy Baumeister, who, mm. who describes it as an escape from the self. And the idea is that consciousness is very onerous on us. You know, we have we have a voice in our heads constantly talking to us. We're very sensitive to how people look at us and our futures and our past and our presence and everything. And the right sort of experiences, often painful experiences, um, could pull us out from it. This is something involved in BDSM, could could um it's involved in intense exercise i i talk in my book the first time i ever did brazilian jiu-jitsu and you know just uh, all of a sudden rolling with this guy who's 20 years um younger than me much stronger much better and everything and they're twisting me in a pretzel like pulling me <laughs> out. But, I'll, but i'll tell you during that period i thought of nothing else I didn't think about my book. I didn't think about my relationships, my children, my bank account. How am I looking? I didn't think it just, and, and there's something about that. When it's over, boom, you realize I was totally in a moment and pain can get you there. Pain and struggle and difficulty and being scared out of your wits, that can get you there. I do think that that is, I guess, the big appeal of something like BDSM or mountain climbing or yeah, eating really right. hot foods. That's right. That's right. There's this line from um, a dominatrix, everybody in the business quotes, you know, that um, once you hold up the whip, people can't take their eyes off of it and they can't think of anything else. And, and I think it's, 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 you know, it's a heavy duty example, but I think when you talk to athletes and I've talked to a fair amount of athletes talking about the book and, and they say, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're playing basketball, when you're, when you're running hard, when you're something, your head's nowhere else. You're just totally in the moment. There's something very appealing to that. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. And um, I guess kind of this must be very deeply prescribed into the human animal as well, because for instance, the BDSM one, if you just look at how many books, for instance, 50 shades of gray is sold. Yeah. Yeah. I try to figure out how popular BDSM is, and it's very difficult to tell. The numbers go crazy depending, there are all these polls, but the numbers go crazy depending on how you ask the question, what population you're asking, there's age differences, there's country differences, but um, but but the book, so all I have is, like I said, as a general, I have the book Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a, a, a depiction of BDSM, um, is the best-selling book of the last decade. The whole 10 years, the last decade, is the best-selling book. The sequel is the second best-selling book. The end of the trilogy is the third best-selling book. Yeah. And so, so that says there's something here that people are drawn to. Maybe not in real life, maybe just in fantasy. That's, that's really interesting. And what, what about something like horror movies? Something I've particularly never been a, a great yeah. fan of. I'm more of a thriller man myself, but I can yeah. understand. The, yeah. It's a great puzzle. It's a classic puzzle, actually, um, which is... Why are we drawn to be afraid when being afraid is typically bad? And, um, and I think there's something to be said there, which brings us back a little bit to evolution, which is one of the things you see in our, our liking of aversive fictions is a draw to sort of worst case scenarios, a draw to experience the world situations that are terrible. And one reason for this may be um, there's different reasons. There's also a feeling of mastery, being able to cope with it. But mm. I think one critical reason is it's a form of practice. It's a useful way to, um, to explore the world when it goes to hell, to explore worst case scenarios. Um, I mean, one analogy is you could think of the imagination as like a flight simulator. You know, how do you get good at flying? Well, you could fly a lot, but then you run the risk of crashing. Flight simulators are a brilliant human invention that gives you a flying-like experience without the actual risks of flying. 
The imagination is like that. The imagination lets you work on different things without the actual risk. And that helps us answer the question, why do we like horror, story, horror movies and aversive fictions? Because you don't always program a flight simulator for a smooth flight. You want to prepare, you want to put in some trouble. And, um, and in some way, you can think horror movies are a form of imaginative trouble. That's a very, very interesting point. And I remember when uh, the Ted Bundy documentaries went on to Netflix. Yeah. I didn't know any men that watched it, but I knew loads and loads of women that, that kind of tuned in. And I guess perhaps, and I, I, this is just, I'm just hypothesizing, but the, perhaps that thing might be less of a risk for men, but women, you know, they might be perhaps a little bit more afraid of that type of stuff. It's, it, it's interesting. I don't know much evidence for this one way or another. So I want to be cautious. But, but look, there's a logic to what you're saying, which is if this view is right, peop, the sort of negative fictions, the horror movies, whatever, that people choose to, should be titrated to their own situation. Women should be kind of drawn to stories of people like Ted Bundy because people like Ted Bundy prey on women. People of children should maybe draw on, maybe in an unhealthy way, to stories of the abduction of children and so on. And so you sort of, you choose your horror movie depending on what scares you the most, what you have yourself to worry about the most. Yeah, yeah, very, 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 very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, just out of curiosity, what actually uh, drew you to this book, uh, to write in this book? And I'm interested into how you... Uh, how your academic interests come to be, because I, I really want to read your, your book on empathy. Uh, and as we kind of talked off here, that's kind of a, um, uh, a counter narrative, if you will, yeah. to much of what, what you hear in, in the, the modern day. So I'm curious how you kind of come up with these, these ideas. And, and yeah, everything, everything uh, you want to know about the book is, is caught up in this title, which is against empathy where I argue that empathy in the sense of putting yourself in another person's shoes, feeling what they feel, is actually a horrible moral guide. At least all sorts of terrible things. We're much better off, and the subtitle up for the book is The Case for Rational Compassion. Um, I, my books tend to, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a research scientist. I run a laboratory. I do experiments a lot with babies and children. Um, I study moral psychology, and some of my books are just offshoots of my research. But to a large extent, I'm just interested in everyday things. So I'm interested in how do people decide what's right and wrong? How do people come to these decisions? For this current book, The Sweet Spot, I got really interested in the question of why do we seek out pain? I see it all over. Once you start looking at it, you seek it all over the place. In the tiniest of ways, you know, you have a sprained ankle and you press on it a bit. Somebody says, you want to see something disgusting? And everybody says, okay. You know, we, we sulk, we, we nurture our anger, we choose to go to haunted houses. And I said, why in the world do we do this? And trying to answer the puzzle is what got me into writing the book. Fantastic. And uh, we always ask whenever an author comes on and uh, they, they've just written a new book, do you have a challenge for, for myself, for our audience, uh, from all your research that you've done into writing this new book, The Sweet Spot, uh, that you could give to us to, to our listeners that you would like to, to, to issue to us based on your work? A challenge. Mm. Um, I guess the challenge would be to introspect on what, because often people like they'll hear it and say, yeah, I don't do that stuff. I just, I just like the fun stuff and everything. So, and they're always wrong. And so introspect on in what ways in your life do you seek out pain and suffering and difficulty and struggle for its own sake, not for any reward, not for any applause, but just because you like it at some level. And I think people find that an informative project. Amazing. What, what would be one of your favorite things that you've suffered over or are there? Yeah. Um, I ran a marathon a while ago. I use that as an example in my book right now. And in fact, I'm going to go in about a half hour. I go to a gym and I'm doing weight training, um, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> definitely an exquisite form of suffering. But, uh, but immensely satisfying. And then, and then there's, you know, we, we start with definition and there's sort of low key things. I like doing crossword puzzles. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, I'm not being shackled by a nominatrix here. I'm not, I'm not being you know, set on fire. It's just, <laughs> I, sit and, I sit and I work diff hard on a puzzle. No payoff. No one's going to give me a prize. Nobody, I'll take off my valuable time when I should be attracting mates and raising children and do a puzzle. 
And the fact that we do this, we seek out effort, it's kind of really cool part of human psychology and really interesting. I think if you could complete a crossword once to dominate Rick's was setting you on fire, perhaps you would win a number one. <laughs> that, would, that would really be that, the, the, the pain trifecta. I know that, yeah, amazing. Um, so yeah, so I just got a couple of last questions to you that we always ask at the end. Uh, so today we've been discussing your fantastic new book, uh, but I would love to ask you in terms of some of the books that have really impacted your life. Do you have any suggestions for our audience about books that you've read that you've loved? Oh, gosh. Well, it, it, in the theme we're talking about, um, my book was was sort of, um, there were two books that had a lot of influence on my own. One we mentioned before, Flow, yeah. by, by Mahalish Jisemiya. Look, I want people to buy my book, but if you had to choose, you should buy Flow instead. Flow is wonderful. And then the other book is A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Um, which, you know, I, the subtitle of my book um, uh, is, is kind of ripped off from his book. And, and his book is a, a Holocaust narrative where he describes the, you know, how to live a good life and the role of meaning and purpose in it. So those are two books I would, uh, I would really uh, push upon you. And then, and then if, you go to my, if you go to my website, um, I, I suggest other books that are more recently written, just kind of fun books. Amazing. Uh, we always ask uh, at the end of each episode uh, a customary question, which which we ask, which uh, we've kind of talked a lot about today, but I wonder if perhaps you have something else to, to, to add on to. We always ask, what makes a life worth living? Um, I guess my contribution w- would, would be to say that's not the sort of question that has a single answer. That, that, that anybody who says this is wrong, it's going to be, it's going to be multi, a lot of different, different things. Uh, yeah. I, I, what, the motivational pluralism was, was the exactly. term. Motivational was, yeah. pluralism. Yeah. I, I love uh, that term. You know, pleasure, meaning, morality, other things besides. Amazing. Amazing. At, at the end of, of every episode as well, we always say, uh, what work of yours would you like to plug where would you like to send our audience any social media handles past books present works articles give it to us oh, send us god, god I'm, on, <laughs> I'm, I'm on twitter uh paul bloom at yale and i have a website uh paulbloom.net so so in there and then my website i have a list of my books i have a list of recent articles you know nah, people aren't going to pour through a bunch of books but i have some 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 sort of small articles in the new yorker and other places that sum up different things going on we will link everything below, including uh, your latest book, The Sweet Spot, which will be in the description. You can just swipe up on this episode and you will see us. Swipe up. Just swipe up. Paul, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so, so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been a great discussion. Well, that wraps up episode 228 of the Freedom Pact podcast with Paul Bloom. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. It was a real privilege to record with Paul. If you enjoyed this content and would like to support the show, there are a few ways in which you can do so. Firstly, this show is free and it will always be free. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to grow this show to reach as many people as we can. So having said that, if you would like to support this show, then we have a YouTube channel in which we post the full interviews in video format as well as clips from interviews, clips from interviews that go way back. And there's much more fun content which we put on there, including conversations between Lewis and myself. We're also spreading the message on socials. Uh, We are at Freedom Pact on Instagram and we are at Freedom Pact Pod on Twitter. Uh, We also have a healthy, wealthy and wise newsletter which you can sign up for. And lastly, one of the other things that you can do is to consider leaving us a charitable review on either Spotify or iTunes. They really, really help us grow the show. When we reach out to guests, it is definitely one of the things that they look for. We want to get the best guests on and continue producing high-level, direct-to-consumer free content. So all of those things would be amazing if you would consider Um, And lastly, if you wanted to interact with us, please shoot us an email, freedompact at gmail.com. 
We'd love to hear from you with any thoughts, pushbacks, ideas, guest recommendations that you may have. And yeah, I think that that wraps up episode 228. This has been a pleasure. I will see you next week for a brand new episode.